second SpaceX Starship presentation. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. There has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. If you are a true Starship enthusiast, I have to urge you to watch today's episode until the end as I have a huge dump of information for you. Arguably even more than what Elon had to say at the Starship presentation a few weeks ago, so stick with me, it's worth it. Second Starship presentation. Did the latest Starship presentation leave you with unanswered questions and did you have the feeling that it did not quite live up to your expectations? Then be prepared for the Starship presentation 2019 2.0 with Paul Wooster, SpaceX's principal Mars development engineer. He spoke at the International Mars Society Conference 2019 at the LA Convention Center and in my opinion did the far better job answering more questions in higher detail than Elon did a few weeks ago. And he must have one of the coolest job titles in human history. Being a founding member of the Mars Society and a real-life Mars development engineer for SpaceX, he emphasized again how important it is to first of all lower the cost of getting payload to Mars before we can think about any sort of colony on our red neighbor. The main part of his work at SpaceX is to plan the missions that will send humans to Mars aboard SpaceX Starships and subsequently will build the first colony and lay the foundation for further development. Falcon 9 and Heavy are often mentioned when it comes to available solutions to colonize Mars today in our community here at What About It. But Mr. Wooster said again that even the Falcon infrastructure would be simply far too expensive to build any meaningful settlement on Mars. Cost has to go down even further. With Starship, SpaceX is doing just that. Rapid reusability, extreme low maintenance costs and with methane, a very cheap propellant that can be produced on Mars to refuel ships for the return flight. Secondly, Starship is built from stainless steel, a very cheap construction material and it is using ceramic heat tiles as a means of heat protection on re-entry. Mr. Wooster stated that SpaceX right now is ramping up cheap mass production of the material and getting it installed in a rapid fashion and that they are aiming for a very low maintenance on the heat shield. He also said that Raptor development is coming along very nicely. Methane produces a nice blue and clean exhaust flame which not only looks nice but also helps with maintenance as there is less soot building up inside the engine, meaning less cleanup is required after a flight. The test program crossed different throttle levels all the way up to 105% and throttling down for landing tests. SpaceX is also ramping up production right now. There were over 12 different engines on the test stand so far. I mentioned before on an earlier episode that Starship and Raptor engines will not use helium to pressurize their tanks. If you leave the helium cycle out of the system, you reduce production cost, weight and cost for the helium itself. The best part is no part. But what about it? How does SpaceX do this? They are using a technique called autogenous pressurization. While on a traditional flight there is helium being pumped into the oxidizer and propellant tanks while they are emptied in flight, to keep the pressure at a constant level, SpaceX will use a portion of the oxidizer and propellant, turn it into gas inside the engine's turbo pumps and feed it back up into the tanks to keep the pressure up. So instead of using the quite expensive helium, SpaceX is able to use the lower cost propellant and oxidizer to pressurize the tanks in flight. This is just one of thousands of design changes compared to a traditional rocket that makes SpaceX save as much money as possible to drive down flight costs even further. And again, SpaceX wants to be able to refuel their starships on Mars and there just is no readily available source of helium on it. One of the main reasons for Starhopper was to study the interaction between the engines and the tanks to get data on how to control this flow of high pressure liquid compared to the low pressure gaseous propellant and oxidizer. Mr. Wooster also confirmed that the ring segments laying around in Cocoa, Florida right now are for the next version of the vehicle aka Mark IV. He also confirmed that there will be static fire tests prior to the first flight and that it would be weeks away and not months. He again emphasized that if this prototype has problems, the next one is right around the corner. So the fast paced testing method will be very very interesting to watch unfold. Test a lot, fly a lot, learn quickly and adjust as they go forward. One more difference compared to Falcon 9 will be the booster landing. 
On Falcon 9, often the landing is downrange on a drone ship in the middle of the ocean. On Starship, SpaceX will try to change this. Boosters will turn around earlier in flight, giving them the ability to almost always return back to the launch site for quick turnaround times. He also talked about refueling again. Thrusters will be used to settle down the propellant in microgravity to avoid slush and fluid dynamics as much as possible. And then differential pressure will be used to transfer the propellant. Paul Wooster called this a brute force approach to again get costs down as much as possible. SpaceX will not use any complex technology to get every last drop of propellant transferred. Instead, they will just bring enough fuel on the tanker. Again, departing from the traditional high-tech thinking of the aerospace industry. He also showed a new and never before seen rendering of the latest version of Starship landed on the moon deploying cargo. We can see the bay doors that are not extending all the way up to the nose anymore. Due to the fact that SpaceX had to move header tanks and batteries into the tip of the nose cone, this now could be the new approach of how to utilize the cargo bay. The cargo bay door is divided into two doors and the cargo bay itself is separated into different segments in this render. It also seems like the lower bay door functions like a lift on rails or a crane platform. It's hard to tell from the picture, but this again would follow the rule of no part being the best part. Why build a separate crane if you can turn the bay doors into moving platforms, right? He also confirmed again that Starship is no either or system. You don't have to stop going to Mars if you're going to the moon. Since it's the same system used for both destinations, you can send flights to both locations at the same time. Heavy equipment to both sites can be transported simultaneously. Then came a really interesting Q&A session where Paul Wooster answered many very interesting questions in great detail. The reason for a much better Q&A compared to the original Elon Musk presentation here mainly being that people who come to a Mars Society conference know better questions to ask than news reporters and journalists. He was asked about the main difference between the Boca Chica and the Coco Starships and he said that the main difference is thickness of the building material. The Coco Starship apparently is lighter and thus cheaper to build. This is going to be the main focus for the next few prototypes as well, he said. Getting down the weight, production time and further reducing production costs. He also said they were able to limit re-entry G's on Mars to 5, which meets the requirement from NASA for deconditioned crew, as after 6 months of flight through space you're not in prime shape as an astronaut. He was asked if early Starship missions to Mars would return to Earth. A question Marcus House, a friend of mine, tried to answer on one of his recent episodes. Instead of sending these early starships back to Earth, he said that they will be staying on Mars, as they would be quite valuable for colonists to be used on the surface. Habitats, propellant plants, power supply, all these early components will be sent integrated into the starships ready for use and just connected on the surface to build out that first stronghold. He answered the long-lasting question if SpaceX will build all these systems needed on Mars. He said that SpaceX wants to encourage an ecosystem. If there are companies out there having ideas and wanting to flesh out any of these needed components, they should approach SpaceX for help and guidance. He also said though that if there are aspects missing, SpaceX would step in and develop these systems in-house to keep the plan moving. He was asked about the many super heavy engines and if they would cause problems in development and later in operation and he gave a good example. When SpaceX was talking about a possible Falcon 5, people asked if that was possible with so many engines. Then the same thing came up again with Falcon 9 and again with Falcon Heavy with its 27 engines. All of this caused zero problems for SpaceX. He said that the step up to Super Heavy was merely incremental and that the only thing they'd need to worry about was acoustic energy as the thrust delivered was unprecedented. He was asked about the timeline and if SpaceX was still pursuing the 2024 target for a manned flight to Mars and he said yes. The plan would still be to send first cargo missions to Mars in 2022 and if everything goes as planned the next step in 2024 would be to send humans. Furthermore, he was asked about Starship's life support system and if that was already in development. He replied that mass cures a lot of sins, meaning that in the beginning a lot of cargo and a few people will travel to Mars. This means that existing technology can be used to do the trick. Tech that is used on Crew Dragon and the ISS. So there won't need to be any development in the beginning, just integration of existing tech. 
He also said that point-to-point -point transportation for Starship is still being developed. This is referring to the proposed plan to use Starships as a replacement for long-distance plane flights, greatly reducing travel times on Earth. He also talked about the internal layout and radiation protection. Starship will have individual cabins and a large common space, both with a central column in the middle, which will be used as a radiation shelter. There will be a layer of consumables and waste products around it, shielding the crew inside from a solar storm event. So the original idea of a radiation shelter on a starship is still being pursued. And of course, there was the question about an abort system again. Paul Wooster replied that a starship would even be able to perform an abort to orbit procedure and that SpaceX intends to produce a very fault-tolerant system. Having a rapidly reusable rocket, they intend to prove its reliability through many, many flights in short succession, demonstrating its safety. As stated all the way in the beginning of this news, Paul Wooster basically provided us with a second, much more detailed Starship presentation the general public didn't even know about. I hope I was able to transfer this knowledge to you and I encourage you to share it with as many people as you can as I believe that this talk at the Mars Society conference was very important but sadly not widely advertised. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? Will SpaceX land people on Mars in 2024 and do you think that the next Starship presentation should be co-hosted by Paul Wooster? As always, tell me in the comments. Here we are again at the end of the episode, giving a shout out to all my patrons. Without their continued support, the show would just not be possible. Constant talks on Discord, facts checking, research and even trip planning. All of it done together with incredible dedication. Thank you very much. And again, we have a new name to put on the list. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Colm M. Robertson. You rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, remember to like and subscribe as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content as this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. There will... <laughs> the waste products, no! <laughs> There will be there will be a layer of consumables and waste products. <laughs> ah, the waste products. Mm -hmm. So the is going to take the heat. Geez, on Mars to to. to, 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 to.